cross is perhaps the most well-known symbol of Christianity. Yet its meaning and significance can feel so far from the world we live in. Perhaps it's because we don't even know what it means to be crucified, what it signifies, or what it feels like. Perhaps it's because we're not in relationship with people who do. About four years ago, I was in a class reading The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James Cone. And in this class, half of the students were in prison. And I realized that I was actually sitting with people who understood more than anyone where Jesus would be if Good Friday were today. He would be convicted and condemned to a prison cell. I knew that moment that the cross would no longer be a distant symbol for me because I was in relationship with people who would have sat to the left and to the right of Jesus' cell. Because I was in relationship with people who were condemned to death, who've had their garments stripped from them, who've been betrayed. I was with people who understood what it meant to have a friend help lighten the load of a sentence, to have women come alongside you in the journey and who knew what it felt like to feel forsaken in a God-forsaken place. I'm thankful for the courage of our incarcerated students in telling their stories. I'm thankful for the friends and faculty who took the time to make sure those stories are heard. And I'm thankful that their stories have brought me closer to understanding the cross, not as a relic, but as a lived reality. I invite you to join us in listening to those stories, to those who would have been closest to where Jesus would be if Good Friday were today. Three walls, some bars, and a cot. How did it come to this? B59883. I am more than a letter in the alphabet and five numbers. My story is complicated, but it's not unique. Unfortunately, for too many, our zip code determines our outcome. I don't wish this on my worst enemy. Look, I want you to understand that I don't hate you. We got a history of brotherhood that nobody can relate to. I'll never forget the times we had. I admit, I was hurt when you signed that statement and testified against me. But I understand now that everybody makes mistakes when they are young. So don't beat yourself up over my situation. I'm doing good. I forgave you a long time ago. How dirty must the window be to prevent the sun from shining through? How cold must the walls be for me to need another blanket in June? How stale must the air be to taste the decay in the back of my throat? And how grey must the paint be to stifle the rays of hope? How forsaken must I be to hear my discreet prayers echo? And how hard must the bunk be for me to rather lay on the floor? How comfortable can a pillow be when it's soaked in my tears? How hurt must I have been to have taken 81 pain pills? How dirty does a window have to be to prevent the sun from shining through? Not that dirty at all, if the only thing visible beyond the window is a wall.
I turned around in that courtroom and looked for the first time since I'd been incarcerated. I mean, really took a close look at my parents. My, how they'd aged in those past three years. But they were there, a bit weathered, but as beautiful and as faithful as ever, waiting for me with literal open arms. What happened next was a feeling that I fear I may never be able to articulate in a meaningful way. As we hug, I felt that I had to be strong, that every fiber of my being wanted to collapse within that embrace and cry out to my mother and father, help me, save me. So there we were, in this awkward embrace. Awkward because it had been so long since I had felt its warmth. As in those first few moments after you've stepped out of a blistering cold into the warmth of your home. You're caught between that chill in your bones and that welcoming heat that you have labored for days to provide. There we were. I, in love, mustering up a strength I did not know I had. She, for the sake of her baby, and also in love, displaying a strength and courage I will never possess. And he, for the sake of both I and she, and in love, displaying that strength and that faith that is spoken of in the Bible as able to move mountains. It was love sustaining and being strengthened by itself. It is that same love that has held me through all of these years and that has fed my hope despite my present circumstances. It is that same love that continues to instruct me and to guide me and to introduce me to others that we too may sustain and strengthen each other. When you realise that your humanity and freedom is tied up in theirs, you begin to feel the weight of their chains. The day that I sat with my friends, my brothers, as they told their stories, I saw what it cost them to do it. I felt the weight of it because I had become part of their stories. I watched them support one another, carrying each other like no other community I've ever been part of. And that's when I understood that solidarity with one another is about fighting for each other's liberation, whatever that looks like. I bet you are surprised to see me here. I know I don't fit in, but God called me here. I've been teaching for so long about justice. I wanted education to be just. Theological education is a gift. It has so much potential to change the world for good, and it should be accessible to everyone, not just free people. So I started an educational program inside a prison. When I arrive, I'm appalled by what I find inside and who we lock up in this country. They are disproportionately people of color. They come from impoverished neighborhoods. They have not had access to quality education. Many suffer from mental illness. Many have English as a second language. Some are sentenced to life, even death, in their youth. They are victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. We have disappeared people with the false idea that we have disappeared the social ills that they represent. We have disappeared people through a system that is connected to unfair sentencing laws, black codes, convict leasing, slavery, racism. We have attempted to disappear our history, banishing it into the cornfields. Then he kicked me in my chest. The blow knocked me off of my feet. And I couldn't catch my breath for a moment. I gathered myself and I tried to get up, but I had to sit back down because my back was hurting from banging into the concrete wall. I got on my knees and I noticed that I dropped my mother's change and bread. I reached to pick it up and Willie kicked me in my rear end. The pain was so bad that I felt like I was going to cry. I rolled over into my back, sat up, and scooted over to the bread and money. I picked up the money and bread and then I stood on my feet. I looked around to see if anyone was going to help me. 
most of the people in the building just laughed. I held back my tears because I wasn't going to let them see me cry. I headed toward the stairwell and I started up the stairs. Once I got to the second floor, I couldn't hold it anymore. The tears just fell. It wasn't the pain that denied me the ability to fight back my tears. It was the embarrassment from the fact that I couldn't do anything. It just took over my emotions. This was the first time that a grown man attacked me because he didn't like my family. I can't say it was the last. As I hang suspended and impaled upon a crucifix constructed by my own iniquitous actions, I languish in unfathomable anguish and misery. Guilt, shame, and hopelessness splinter my flesh and my infected wounds draw swarms of flies that aggravate me as I hemorrhage and asphyxiate. Blinding pain causes tears to blur my vision, rendering it impossible for me to focus on the figures around me. Terror seizes my heart and my savagely battered anatomy tenses, anticipating the next impact of violence. Instead, I feel the delicate caresses of individuals attending to my injuries. The aroma of perfume floods my nostrils transporting my imagination instantaneously to an Edenic garden paradise. Soft, melodic voices whisper words of hope, peace, mercy, joy, truth, and life. But they are not merely the empty platitudes of a hospice chaplain. Every syllable they utter revitalizes and heals. My mind races and I wonder, why are you here? Why don't you hate me too? How did you get past the guards? Are you angels? As I look back over the 13 years of my incarceration, the vast majority of visitors and volunteers have been women. As much as our culture projects the image that men are more heroic, fearless than their female counterparts, my experience has been that women are far superior in their willingness to endure hardships, deal with trauma, and confront injustice. As the women at the crucifixion, the North Park superwomen are virtually all I see ministering to me as I am being slowly tortured to death by the criminal justice system something my own family has never done. In conjunction with my crucifixion, these feminine phenoms are the only ones to witness my resurrection and transformation. In fact, they rush to my tomb fully expecting a miracle. I was stuck. I was filled with self-loathing. I was being honest and I was admitting to my offenses, but these admissions were leaving me filled with self-hatred. I hated looking into a mirror because I didn't like what I was seeing. Even some of my peers and group members were judging me as a sick person who should never be allowed out of prison. Out of fear, I would reoffend. I hated myself which led to hating others. I believe God hated me as well. But I began to realize that God didn't want me to destroy myself. He loved me, yes, and he wanted me to repent so that I could be forgiven and I had to accept that. God didn't hate me no matter how much I hated myself. Strip down to your underwear, are the orders he barks at me, and I slowly obey, trembling in fear. 
Fresh welts throbbed from the tender surface of my youthful skin as he whipped me with the black belt like I was a Hebrew slave. And hot tears of shame ran relays down my tiny face, each one racing behind the other as if they were trying to catch up while they jumped the hurdle of my jawbone and formulated a shallow pool of resentment in the fragile pocket of my collarbone. Facial contortions, sobbings, and utter bewilderment were the colors applied to my countenance by the paintbrushes of physical and verbal abuse as I stood there shaking in the middle of the brightly lit kitchen floor. Thank God for the chapter on Darwin in my book, for stopping the slug just short, but the other no such luck. As it pierced my still growing spinal cord, falling face down, a bullet burning a hole in my heart. Or was it the hate that I feel then or now, as my legs went limp and things went dark in the embrace of an ambulance, in a blood lost trance, riding on the wings of light and sirens, will death be the final consequence? Why hast thou forsaken me? You should not have taken him. Instead, you should have taken me. When they killed him, God, they also killed me. They stripped me of everything I have and left me for naked. A mother's not supposed to bury her child. But today it seems expected. How am I supposed to change that for which you have ordained? If you will give me anything that I ask in your precious name, help me. And I will never be the same. I heard the echo screams of a mother's pain as she laid over her young boy's lifeless frame while trying to hold the wet slush that was now his brains. The earth shook from the vibration of her tears as they smacked, the pavement that was left bloodstained like symbols of no tomorrow, a constant reminder that life is something that's borrowed. I wanted to meet with you because I wanted you to know, for what it's worth, how your son's death changed my life. What I have here in my hand, and please feel free to stop me whenever you like, or if you have any questions or anything that you'd like to say. These papers are referred to as a victim impact statement. These words were entered into the court proceedings during the penalty phase of my trial. These are your words, and I've read these words so many times over the years. You spoke lovingly about your son, whom you referred to as your best friend. I'll never forget that. You also spoke about your grandson, whom you assured me would be taken care of lovingly, financially, and developmentally. And you also spoke about me. And you said... I said that I hope you would see the error of your ways and decide to make a change in your life and make your life count for something rather than wasted due to wrong decisions and choices. 
you rejected the zero-sum game and refused to label me, to put me in a category, to scapegoat me. You held the tension between them and us at what had to be the most difficult time in your life. Your words kept me from the depths of despair and depression, and every single day I strive to honor them. I was incarcerated for approximately 20 years. Today, I am a graduate student at North Park University, studying to earn a Master's of Arts in Christian Ministry with a restorative arts track. Part of the work that I get to do deals with conflict transformation and conflict resolution in communities susceptible to violence. My dad was also shot and killed when I was just six years old. So growing up and knowing all too well the hurt and the pain of my own loss, I would have never imagined being part of an act that would cost another father his life or another son his father. My son was the only child that the Lord saw fit for me to have. And I cared for him the best I could. A parent has to realize that after your children reach a certain age, you have to believe that you've done the best that you can and leave them in the hands of the Creator. There is not a day that comes that I do not remember, feel, or see my son. We were the best of friends that either of us had. I am an old woman. I've seen the conflicts in our communities turned into someone else's property. Our children are seen as nothing but a commodity. They call it justice. I have seen such a focus on the individual responsibility, but nobody wants to talk to you about the collective responsibility of society. I'm so grateful to God that my son's death was not in vain. You are going to be all right. You're going to bring so many young men out of that darkness and you're going to help break the cycle. Every excerpt that was a part of these Stations of the Cross was written by one of our students at North Park's School of Restorative Arts. Many were from a redemptive storytelling cohort that we piloted this past year called Restory. They are read by the faculty and friends of the School of Restorative Arts. These stories, along with many others, were workshopped into a performance piece that will be performed this summer by actors at Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago. To learn more about ReStory and the School of Restorative Arts, please visit the website at the bottom of your screen. The goal of ReStory and its performances is to redeem the narrative around mass incarceration in a way that leads to God's restorative justice being enacted in our criminal justice system here in Illinois and beyond. We are people of story. And part of understanding God's story is understanding our place in it, both where we have been and where we are going. This is about changing the world around us and being a part of God's restorative work in our city, in our country, and in our world by speaking truth into a narrative that has been twisted and used for evil rather than being used for rehabilitation and restoration. This is about humanizing those who have been dehumanized and about integrating the narrative of mass incarceration into God's story rather than accepting the world's narrative about our prison system.